Hi, welcome to Three Skulls Tavern. I'm your host, Matt, and this channel is devoted to tabletop role-playing games, and more specifically, strong, strong focus on the role-playing games by Free League Publishing, which are my favorite publishers and create the games I like the most. Anyway, before we jump into the interview with Tomas, the lead developer on Blade Runner, I just wanted to mention that I did an interview with Tomas back in September of last year, where we touched on a lot of topics like scope beyond LA, scope beyond the current timeline, like looking at the 2022 blackout. We talked about solo play, um, a, lot of, a lot of discussion around what exactly the game was going to be about and what the game was not going to be about. Now, I'm mentioning that because before I jump into this interview, I'm not going to be retreading that same ground because Tomas made it very clear, even though it was close to a year ago, that this initial core offering was going to be very much focused on LA and case files. So rather than using a lot of the limited time I have with Tomas retreading that ground, if you want to hear about that, then I strongly recommend you pause this video, jump back to the previous video, there'll be a link in the description below, and watch that, as this will be a follow-on from that video and not retreading similar themes. Although it's inevitable that we will be talking about some of the same content. So I'm not going to bore you with any more information like asking you to, I don't know, hit the subscribe and like button. So let's jump over to our interview with Tomas. All right, thanks for joining us, Tomas. And um, I guess before we launch into the many, many questions I've got from my own uh, list of questions and from the various communities I reached out to, why don't you tell those who aren't familiar um, who you are and what your role is on Blade Runner? Yeah, I'm Thomas Ernstam. I'm the lead designer of the game. Uh, I wrote uh, most of it together with uh, Joe Lafavi, who does the main setting work. And we have, there are other contributors also, but uh, I guess Joe and me wrote uh, most of it. Uh, I also have to be the CEO of Free League Publishing, so I'm just kind of juggling that role uh, as well. Cool. All right, so you're writing, this is very much the similar setup to Alien, right? Where you're writing yeah. the... Um, mechanics and the game mastering sort of stuff and you have a an expert writing all the setting related stuff cool exactly yeah very much the same setup cool all right um i kind of alluded that there's a lot of questions <laughs> um the yeah. way i thought of breaking this up was to go through the sort of table of contents that um generally tend to follow the the year zero engine books um, right. because they tend to be grouped around similar themes. So uh, basically questions around the character, your character, questions around the rules, questions around the kind of gameplay, which also kind of touches on what the GM can be is doing, um, mm -hmm. touching on the setting, and then some general questions at the end. So if we start with the, the character section, um, I guess the first thing for me is looking at group size. Uh, in the FAQ on the Kickstarter, it mentions one to four players. And for me, I'm actually planning on running something on the show for probably one, maybe two players, because I, that to me seems like a like matches a little bit with what is in the films. From playtesting, what's the kind of sweet spot for player number? <laughs> That's a good, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, we in our internal playtesting, play we you, typically we had uh, a game runner, which was me, and three players for most of the tests. We did some of the tests with, with uh, fewer also, but uh, three is a good number. I think, like you said, I think it's going to work really well with one or two players because that, you know, just considering the source material and the noirish theme of it all, that, it, that lone protagonist, it, of course, makes a lot of sense. But uh, the way with three players, uh, it works fine, and the, the game really encourages actually splitting uh, splitting the parties. I think that's something in this game you should not be afraid of, because if you run around like a team of three or four everywhere, it 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 will get unwieldy. And also, yeah. actually, the scenarios, the case files are designed in such a way that if you do that you will probably not solve the case in time before something bad happens. So you will need to split up to cover more ground if you're a bigger group. 
Aha, interesting. I've been playing a lot of the Tales from the Loop board game recently, and that is this, right. sounds like yeah. a similar concept I'm very familiar with. It is a bit similar to that. <laughs> and the, the mechanics are completely different. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, the general idea is a bit similar. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you have stuff that will go on and happen in the background. We call them countdown events that will happen okay. no matter where you go in your investigation. And that means if you're too slow, these events will come to pass uh, unless you're, you know, okay. quick enough to, to to stop them. Some of them might not be chaotic. Some of them will just be interesting. So okay. if you're, you fail to get there in time, it doesn't mean the end of the game. It just means it plays out differently than perhaps you had hoped it would. Cool. All right. Yeah, sounds sounds good. So from my perspective, it sounds like rather than going with a single player, I'm probably going to go with two then <laughs> to get yeah, the most yeah. out of splitting the party, maybe, because um, yeah. it sounds like there might be some some interesting uh, things to happen there. Okay. Yeah. Um, just while we're on the topic of um, group size, there's obviously a lot of people talking about solo mode and solo support. Mm -hmm. And obviously, yeah. I mean, if, if anyone watching hasn't seen it yet in the FAQ, um, it's addressed there that there isn't going to be solo uh, a solo mode for Blade Runner, but it's not exactly ruled out. Um, I'm just kind of curious. I kind of want to poke my fingers in there a little mm -hmm. bit and say, uh, as somebody obviously, as you know, is is quite interested in solo um, yeah. role playing. Yeah. Is there potential for I don't know, like a future Kickstarter for it? You mentioned that it it could be it's a, a book in its own right. Is that something yeah. you can? I mean. I'm just kind of curious about um, the decision to get to that point where it's been ruled out rather than probably not like it was last year. Mm, yeah, I mean, it's a, obviously it makes sense from a thematic point of view to have a solo mode for a game like Blade Runner. I mean, that's that of course. Yeah, so we're not you know, surprised by the question. We considered it, we discussed it a lot internally. But as you know, uh, this is a, a in, it's based on investigations and I mean, most solo rules modules for, for RPGs, uh, including free league RPGs, are, are Oracle based and they're yeah. based on, on a fairly free form sandboxy type play where you kind of wander the lands and, yeah. uh, and you have encounters and you have, use the Oracle to see how they play out and how. Yeah. And it's very much of an exploratory type of play. And that's. No, and that works perfectly uh, for some games like Forbidden Lands, uh, Twilight Thousand. I mean, it, it that fit perfect because those games are very much like that. Even yeah. if you play them with a size group. But this game, Blade Runner, you will be solving cases primarily. Obviously, you can do what you want the way it's structured. Um, and uh, for that to work in a solo environment, you really have to rewrite the whole. Yeah. thing it could be really cool but that's why we write that's almost like a game of its own yeah. it would almost be like i mean a big inspiration for blade runner is uh, the sherlock holmes games the consulting yeah. detective game which mm -hmm. are uh, i mean they can be played solo so basically yeah. uh, to turn this into a solo game that we would pretty much have to rewrite the case files into for along those lines uh, yeah. where you okay. can look up paragraph and, and and you know and that could work but it's, a, it's kind of a simple, small, or I mean, even it's not even a 20 page PDF module. Yeah. It would be a, sure. for each case file would be need to be fully converted into such a format. And it would pretty much be its own game or at least a sizable module. You could yeah. potentially still use like the combat rules and things that you might not repeat those. I mean, they might work. Yeah, yeah. In, School. Well, you're, but the whole you're touching on some case file would be uh, completely converted. So it's it's a bit beyond the scope of the Kickstarter. But yeah. it could definitely yeah. happen some time sometime later down the line. That's not ruled out. You're kind of you're gonna make me think of these these things here, um, which are Call of Cthulhu's solo game books, which are effectively mm. like choose your own adventure style, right? Um, yeah. Which seems like that. Kind of sounds like a similar type of solution, maybe. Anyway, I don't want to go down yeah. the solo rabbit hole with you because <laughs> yeah. there's a lot of other stuff to get through. Um, it's, it's not, you know, not ruled out forever, but it's sort of beyond the scope. Yeah, of this for sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so looking back at now characters, are you able to, I guess, tease or, uh, yeah, tease the archetypes that are going to be in the core rulebook? So far, we've sure. seen the inspector, the city speaker, the doxy, and the skimmer. Skimmer hasn't been unlocked yet. 
Uh, although I I checked like an hour ago, it might have been, we were very very close. But um, yeah, just kind of curious if if that's something you can share more of. Uh, yeah, I guess so. Uh, <laughs> I have to think which one which was we had already shown. Yeah, the inspector and the three stretch ones, I yeah. believe. So right. city speaker yeah. is like a is like a is like a um, gutter rat. Doxy exactly. is like a, a replicant assassin. Much like the gaff type character. That's yeah. your city speaker. And then, uh, uh, yeah, the inspector is basically, I mean, that's, you know, yeah. Harrison Decker or, or, yeah. or, or Ryan Gosling. You know, it's like Deckard or K. I mean, that's yeah. kind of that. And uh, then you have, uh, yeah, the Doxy, which is kind of a social infiltrator type. Uh, and then, uh, of course, the skimmer, which is kind of a, you know, kind of a rough college, something like dirty cop kind of idea of a character uh, that can be kind of fun to play. Uh, beyond those, uh, we also have something called an enforcer, which is more of a military or special operations, you know, special forces type of uh, character. Uh, and then we have to, uh, there is the fixer, which is uh, also a social climber, almost mm -hmm. like a, you know, versed in politics and then social uh, climbing and all of that stuff. I think that's almost. I might want to save okay. maybe one or <laughs> two for you know for for later. But yeah, yeah, that's at least uh, that's cool. That's yeah, a few of them. Yeah. So kind of tied in with this that question, um, thinking about how the characters fit. I know we talked about this as well last time. But it, it comes up a lot. A lot of people are asking this question. Will there be other group concepts rather than the kind of you're part of a police organization invest, you know, doing the casework? I'm, I'm aware that that is definitely casework focused. You've, you've just mentioned that as well. Um, yeah. But just kind of curious about and a lot of people are curious about, um, you know, what other kind of group concepts might be possible or if it is limited to just being working for the Blade Runner department. Yeah. Yeah, like you said, I mean, the core game that we're building now and the, the case file structure, since that is the structure of the game, uh, it, it, it's based on, and we, on, on um, investigations that you will be doing as a Blade Runner. We think that's a very, you know, that's the key the immediate key concept uh, for the game. And uh, we think there is so much to explore, even staying within those confines, that it might be uh, uh, these cases that you will be investigating can be a much more varied, perhaps, than you might think at first glance. So I don't think you should see that as, as a limiting factor necessarily. There is so much to explore yeah. within that role that I think that is definitely a full game in itself. But yeah, obviously this is a rich and varied world and we do have uh, ideas about uh, going beyond the, I mean, there's uh, yeah, various ideas on what other, other types of character concepts uh, that could be possible. Uh, that is also not part of this Kickstarter. So that's for later down okay. the line. But yeah, we do have ideas and we uh, would like to do it down the line, but we cannot confirm anything specific yeah. right now. Sure. Okay. Um, replicants. We know that there's going to be player character replicants, assuming they're going to be Nexus 9 models like K from uh, 2049. Um, how do they differ mechanically from human PCs? I mean, assuming there's, I mean, will there be things like an expiration date on them? Uh, we've already seen that there are two panic tables when you teased the um, the stress and the panic spread. Um, oh, we haven't yeah. seen that. We haven't seen the panic tables for the replicants, but we know it's we know it's there. Uh, but what are some of the other ways that that replicants? I mean, in my head, I'm instantly going to the um, the androids from Alien and how they kind of differed mechanically uh if you're playing one as a as a player character but uh, how are they how are they kind of handled here or can you talk about that at all yeah a little bit i mean i should say also just as a general caveat that the game is is largely finished but it's still okay not 100 finished it's still under development things are still changing we it's not we don't have uh, everything is not finally approved or anything so things can still change so that's yeah. you know an important point to make that anything <laughs> i say 
here could potentially change. Yeah. So even though I think most things will stay the way they are uh, at the moment, but yeah, just clear. But yeah, it's an interesting dilemma in a way how to make replicants feel different and still not because that's I think uh, you know you can make various situations of Blade Runner and be these films and other media the way you you want but I think in, at the point that is made is that it, it, your kind of humanity as a person is not determined if you're you know replicant or human uh, I think it's very different from at least in my mind I mean typical you know robots or, yeah. or synthetics in, in other media I mean replicants are much more human than that yeah. so yeah. we didn't want to they're not robots I mean yeah. by far so they're quite and that that's also a reason we didn't want to make them mechanically drastically different because they're not really I mean, there's i mean there's still obviously in in, in uh, there's the whole discussion on who's a replicant and who's human i mean that would make zero sense if they were mechanically drastically different I mean, then, then that whole yeah. thing would just you know not be possible or, or a thing but that said there are some differences and uh one that you mentioned is the way they react to stressful situations there and there's like a special a different stress a critical stress effects is what we call them and there's a different table for that uh, replicants are typically uh, can be stronger and can take more of a beating than humans can but they are a, a bit more susceptible to other effects then there's also, okay. of course the social standing factor because even though uh, replicants have been reintroduced uh, into on earth a year before the game starts they are still very much seen uh, viewed with skepticism and even seen as second rate people so that be, playing a replicant will you know force you to grapple with some of the prejudices or or or, or uh, handicaps of being you know seen as being part of maybe a mass of citizens and, and that also has some mechanical effects because there there are some, there's something called promotion points mm -hmm. and chinian points which is basically your money and uh, both of those will be a bit harder to come by than you for example so there are differences but i wouldn't they're not radical they're more subtle than okay that. yeah well, that makes sense yeah okay cool um you've Again, we talked about this last time a little bit, but the answer was that you were still looking into it and didn't have an <laughs> have a, have a like a definitive answer. I'm super curious about the existential um, dilemmas and the moral um, the kind of moral elements of the of the game in terms of mechanics. Are you able to kind of uh, shine a light on any of that? Yeah, possibly, but you. If you could be a bit more specific, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> tell me all about it. <laughs> just read it from the just read it from the book. Um, yeah. So, I guess what what part of the character is there some sort of like character trait? Thinking of other Year Zero Engine games where you have things like pride or motivations or whatever they are in all the different games, I'm assuming that there's going to be some sort of um, morality trait of some description. Um, is that the case? And if so, can you tease a little bit about how, I mean, you've already mentioned that humanity, uh, you've mentioned humanity a few times. We've seen something called humanity points in one of the spreads as well. So uh, there's going to be, you know, some sort of meta currency to do with humanity anyway, which I assume takes us into the existential side of things. But from the morality side of things, obviously a Blade Runner's job is to, is to effectively kill uh, hunt down and kill replicants oh. and that's going to erode it just as we've seen in the movies that gets them to start questioning their morality even their own humanity and how do you kind of track that specific element of it in in this yeah yeah i mean that's definitely a big, I mean, a big part of the game obviously i think a couple of things there to comment on is that uh, the way we have defined the role of a Blade Runner in this game is not as narrow as that you just described. Okay. Uh, yeah. That has is what mainly been seen in in the films, perhaps, but uh, in the reintroduction, replicants are reintroduced, and also replicants being on the uh, in the Blade Runner unit. The cases that a Blade Runner can be sent to investigate can be a much more varied than just 
uh, hunting killing replicants that that it's it can pretty much be any case that involves any kind of uh, synthetic it can even be i mean there you have these animoids that are the uh, artificial oh, yeah. animals that are quite a big part of the game as well it can even be a case re re in, in that, that that has to do with those and of course replicants in any shape or form it doesn't need to be that hunt and kill it can definitely be something completely different that in some way involves replicants uh, okay. so that that the scope of what you will be doing is much broader than that that you just described i think that's a first point to be made uh, otherwise i don't think it would be uh, you know work uh, yeah. as the game and it would also be uh, you know it's, uh, i think it's there is much more to do in this world than that and but yeah you're right there are uh to kind of ground the character in 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 the world and and give them a a, a moral sort of speak i guess backdrop is is two concepts that uh, is called one is a key memory and another one is a key relationship and both of those two kind of give your nice. character a baseline or a ground them in, in the world in a way that they will need to grapple with and that will inform the decisions that they make. Okay. Um, they will not be mindless, you know, hunter killers. Uh, that, that just, I mean, that's not, will not be possible. And uh, like you also mentioned, another mechanic that you mentioned already is that you have what we call humanity points, two kinds of meta currencies. There are the promotion points and humanity points and to excel uh, in the game and and make your character grow or, or work in, in you will prop you will need to kind of get or <laughs> collect both types of points if you only go one route and get one of them that that will probably put you in, in trouble so they as of later on you have to kind of balance your official duties with what your conscience tells you and and uh, that's kind of the point of the game in a way okay cool yeah Cool. You've kind of touched on that answer was quite, quite big. It touched on a lot of the other questions I had there. So um, let's jump out of the character space and look at the rules. And um, I, I guess there's been a lot of discussion, especially in like the year zero engine community about why there's been the Twilight 2000 stepped die mechanic being used instead of the dice pool mechanic. Yeah. And one question that somebody asked, which um, is quite an interesting question from my perspective as well is is that step die mechanic a sign of things to come for the years of hmm. engine <laughs> i don't know maybe we'll see i guess uh, <laughs> uh it's it's not the case that this is the way we're doing it now from now on okay. that yeah. that is not the case there will most likely i don't even i don't know because we we're i mean we're in we do are developing other games uh but uh uh, that are coming but you know they're still in development so i'm not sure what they would look like but i would think that there will be d6 based user engines games to come so it's, okay. it doesn't mean this is the only <laughs> way to do it from now on uh the way the reason we did it this way this time around that uh, we felt that the d6 version of the engine it generally works really well uh it's it uh, we're happy with it um i think the one point that, that it's sometimes you will roll a lot of dice basically uh, and that means counting dice rolling dice that's kind of a big it takes up a lot of table space to be honest yes and that can be fine for definitely most games i think that that is not a negative but we felt for for a game like this that is so focused on investigations case work character development and really kind of introspection, a lot of other things going on and all just all these handouts. I think the uh, introductory, the initial scenario, the case file that is included in the starter set has 28 handouts or something. I There's think, a, I've seen the picture, it's it's huge. It's yeah. a huge amount of stuff. Basically yeah. your table will be covered by handouts, <laughs> which is kind of the point. You have to yeah. sift through the evidence to really find yeah. The truth and we, we just felt that rolling like 10 dice on top of that it, it'll be unwieldy we wanted something a bit more lightweight uh, a little less intrusive just both in terms of table space and kind of mind space yeah and this version of the engine that uses two dice primarily uh, you can roll one or three in special occasions but two is kind of the typical uh, roll 
uh, that kind of is a, le a little bit less intrusive. And uh, it, you know, the math behind it doesn't change that much. So basically, you, it doesn't change the mechanics drastically in terms of how it plays out. A little bit, but not, okay. not it's still, yeah. we feel the same, you, you will, you know, the type of, of, of chances of success and so on, they're, they're fairly similar, they translate fairly well in terms of I mean, this this system basically has four levels uh, of, of, for example, a skill level. Just a typical uh, D six based tier zero engine system has five, so it's a yeah. bit of a difference. But they convert quite easily, so it's yeah. it's not a drastic uh, departure. Uh, it's it's a version of it that we felt kind of felt better at the table. It was really a, a, a uh, an idea that that I had that I wanted to try out. So we tried it in playtesting, not being sure whether we would do this or just go back to a, a D6 based system. But in in our internal playtesting, we felt it worked. Yeah. So we kept it. Cool. All right. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna latch onto something you mentioned there, which is the you might sometimes roll three dice. Um, right. <laughs> what. How what what is that? How does that work? Can you say anything about about that? Yeah, I guess uh, without getting too specific. But um, the other game that we have that uses a similar system is uh, uh, Twilight Two Thousand. That you know, and it it uh, the way you modify roles in Twilight Two Thousand is that you you step dice up and down. Yeah, uh, which is fine. Uh, but because that, and Twilight Two Thousand is a game that kind of needs quite a bit of crunch and and modifiers because things. Details yeah. need to matter in that game in terms of you know battlefield conditions and everything. Uh, for Blade Runner, like I mentioned, we wanted a, a lighter system uh, that doesn't a less crunchy system that still provides you know realistic results that that you know and you know inform the drama and, and the game, but uh, uh, a little bit less detailed. So that's why we instead of stepping dice up and down, you basically add or remove. A die from your roll instead. Okay. I won't. I won't pry anymore. <laughs> um, there was another question that came up, which is very open ended, um, but it says, "What new twists on the Year Zero engine can we expect in Blade Runner?" Um, and mm. the, they were specifically we mentioning. Yeah, we did. Yeah. Um, no. That's fine. I won't. I won't pry for more for more uh, teasers. <laughs> um, and another question that's come up, I've seen a few times, uh, the Voight Kampf machine. Um, right. Can you share a little bit about how that will work mechanically? Uh, yeah, I guess so. I mean, it, it, at this point in the timeline, the Voight Kampf machine is, is, is still used by some, uh, but it's not like the be all end all Blade Runner machine because uh, uh, the later generations of replicants they are not they are uh, i mean they have basically they have you can they have a you know a serial number basically in the in the in the eye so you you, you don't really need a void kampf machine to, to find out yeah uh, if someone is a replicant or not unless they are an older generation or some for some other reason uh, that is not clear uh, or, or possible to determine some other way so they are still in use but they're not like the core thing you would be yeah. doing in the game. They're still around, but there are many other types of, of tools and tests. Like the baseline that is that is shown in Blade Runner 2049 yeah. so, so in the game. But yeah, there is the, the Voidkampf test is there uh, and the empathy test is there and it's it has a mechanic. I won't go into extreme specifics, but it's it's there and there's a mechanic for it. Okay. All right. Okay, let's jump across into the gameplay side of things a bit more. Um, we've already talked about um, things to do other than just retiring um, replicants. We've we've already yes. kind of crossed that or talked about that. Uh, but what is a this is a question that came up, um, which I thought was quite nice. What does a standard session look like? What do, what do the players do in the game? I mean, typically uh, the case files that will be. I mean, the first one, electric beams, that is part of the starter set. And and then we'll publish more, and then we'll offer a wide variety of tools for game runners to create their own. Because this game, at least the way it's designed, then obviously people will play it however they want on the, at their table. But the way it's designed, uh, it's focused around uh, having case files, playing case files. 
and uh, a case file typically has you know a backstory npcs and locations and lots of clues and, and, and handouts that we kind of interconnect those so it's it's not all that different from from what you see in Vesen or Tales from the Loop, even even though there is a bit more complex. There are more. It's a bit harder to puzzle the clues together. The more locations, more NPCs. There is, okay. yeah. But I mean, the, the basic structure is not all that different. I think another difference is that it's structured uh, in in shifts uh, of time uh, that you might have seen in some of our other games as well. You have four shifts in a day. And, and typically, this is a you know uh, you'll cover one location per shift, okay. and uh, that means you also have to manage time because if you're and that 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 we mentioned earlier, if you're a larger group, uh, the countdown events will come faster, and you will be, be uh, forced to kind of split the party uh, to cover more ground uh, yeah. in a shorter period of time. So you'll basically do that casework, but then at uh, around every once per day so after like three shifts of, of work every character needs uh, a shift of downtime and downtime is not just you know i'll go home and rest it's it is it can be that but it's it can be a lot more and it's an opportunity to play individual scenes uh, that kind of grow the character i mean basically uh, if you i mean it's it's the scene where k goes home to meet you know it's uh, the, the dg uh, um, uh, hologram and then or you know decker going off this apart whatever i mean you know these it's kind of that thing where you you can in you know explore what your character does when not on the job and that can be a wide variety of things but it's these scenes can interact and interface also with the actual casework yeah uh, because there you're not just going from location to location but things can happen that you really didn't expect uh, there are mechanics for involving your, I mentioned before, the key memory and the key relationship of your character, how okay. to bring those into the game. That would, should, mostly happens during downtime in, in, in interesting ways. And that those scenes can also play out over even longer narratives. So you can have something play out uh, for in your downtime for your own character that, that, that carries on uh, over several case files. Uh, so that's kind of how it ties together. So you have the casework, but then you have the downtime, the, you know, the more personal individual story, and they are in par they, they, they progress in parallel and sometimes overlap. Okay. That's cool. That's very cool. Um, yeah, I think Year Zero Engine people will be uh, familiar with the concept. It's interesting to see the the more structured side and the, having like a countdown timer is quite... Again, I've, I've been playing a lot of Tales from the Loop, the board game, and it just... Uh, um, I'm going to recommend that. I'm going to I'm going to plug that because that's also by by Freely mm. Publishing. Um, you know, you might 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 get you into the right headspace maybe for Blade Red while you're waiting. Um, sure. Cool. The case files. This, now this is another this is another big topic. There are a lot of questions being asked about it. We already know that it's more. You've mentioned in a number of places that it's there. It's going to be more about player skill rather than rolling to to solve cases. That's why yeah. we have such a big focus on handouts and et cetera. But the question is still coming up. Well, how much dice rolling will be involved with solving case files? Will there be any, um, is that something you can kind of just very briefly bring to bring to rest? <laughs> yeah, uh, sure. I mean, there's a, a couple of different things. Dice rolling can and will come into it. Uh, usually, I mean, obviously that's kind of a, now a given, I think, in, in, in investigative role playing that it's, yeah. it will never be the case that, you know, fail the role, you, you, you know, you fail the case. Yeah. So, I mean, that you were never, you will, they will never be structured like that. Uh, so rather uh, rolling dice and, and succeeding can help you, uh, you know, easier find clues maybe in some cases, uh, if you, you know, there is like an option of, you know, find it on your own as a player, or, uh, or if you fail, you can roll. If you don't, you can roll, but then maybe it takes a bit longer time, something like that. So there will be a benefit of rolling or, or having good, and it can be a kind of a fallback in some cases. And uh, since you'll be playing Blade Runners that belong to the Reptitech unit, there's also a mechanic for using skills to, uh, what do you call it, to, to uh, get new gear or more gear uh, or oh. help re like using that like a resource. Re yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can roll dice to kind of uh, 
requisition gear or equipment for, for to help you. You can roll, there's a skill called connections that you can roll to kind of, you know, find, you know, people yeah, on the street or something about the case. Uh, if you fail that roll, it, it doesn't mean you don't find a clue. It means that it's just one, that's one way of finding a bit of information that might be available. I mean, the way we structured case files is that basically every important piece of information needs to be in at least two places and possibly even three or four. Uh, okay. So, Rolling dice can be one way to find a piece of information, but there will always be other ways. So it's going to help you, but it will not determine single-handedly if you succeed yeah. or fail. Okay, that seems quite nice because then it doesn't it doesn't make it frustrating for the players if they can't figure it out. But at the same time, you yeah. have that time pressure running in the background. Yeah. Um. So if you if you yeah, okay, that's that's interesting. <laughs> very very much want to see more of it. Anyway, um, let's jump ahead a little bit here. Um. One question I had it was about investigation sheets. Are we going to see any kind of like, um, uh, like a, a special sheet to go alongside the the player the character sheet, where we can kind of keep yeah, track of clues uh, and things like maybe that? Maybe we should show that. It's a good point. Uh, yeah, did, I didn't see anything on the that. Kickstarter yet, but yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, there, we have something called the time tracker okay. uh, sheet. Basically, it it helps. I mean, this is a game you'll probably need to take some know as a player so we yeah. have some you know some 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 ideas about that and this sp specific sheet basically it's it's a simple grid with you know you have day one to seven i think i don't think all, most cases will not run for seven days but you know potentially they could uh, and then you know on the other row there are shifts one to four and then basically you know on what locations you visited and when and that just gives you kind of a nice uh, looking back, you know, where did yeah. we go? When did we go there? You know, just to keep track of, of that. Yeah. Uh, and okay. then there is like a general sheet on the back of it where you can write more general thoughts and ideas and, and you know, okay. uh, just to put down things that you discover in the game. Cool. Cool. All right. Um, and I guess last question from gameplay. Um, just aware that we've we're kind of don't have a huge amount of time left. Um, someone was asking about the making homebrew cases, mm. and there's a bit of a worry, um, and I get this as well. That if you want to make your own homebrew cases, there's there's such a big focus here on um, published case files and handouts and player skill in solving things. Mm. How much will homebrew case files rely on handouts and? Will it be possible to create case files without, without them, or not having so many? Will it, I mean, yeah, I guess you, you get the question. <laughs> yeah, sure, I get it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I would say I think handouts are. I mean, I love handouts. That's so it's we we have a lot of them in in the published case files, but there is nothing intrinsically, you know, in in the structure of a case file that absolutely requires there to be any handouts. Clues okay. can take in forms. So absolutely, it's completely possible to write a case file for your group uh, without handouts. That said, we do have some ideas for tools, uh, fairly you know, easy to use digital tools that could be you know, used to create handouts. I mean, to get some assets that along those lines, but uh, I'll, uh, you know, more on that later, I think. But but uh, yeah. So if, if you do enjoy making handouts, uh, that's that's something we encourage, and we'll provide some tools for it. Okay. Cool. Um, let's jump. Let's jump into the setting then, very quickly. Um, there weren't a huge amount of um, questions from the community about the setting, and we did talk in a previous interview a lot about you know the scope trying to figure out exactly what, what it was going to cover, what it was going to cover. Um, but I guess the first question is, uh, people have been asking about who's going to, who the guest writer is. Uh, you said Joe Le, Le Favre. How, what's his name? Again? Le Favre, yeah. How exactly. do you spell his surname? Because I, I tried Googling him and couldn't find him. <laughs> L-E-F-A-V-I. Ah, okay, good. I Okay, I had I made it into like a bit of a French name with an R-E on the end. Ah, okay, Le Favre. Okay, cool. Um, so... Obviously, he's writing the the setting elements of the book. Um, I'm just kind of curious about things about uh, th things like gear. You mentioned already that there you can requisition gear with a dice roll. Um, yeah. A lot of people associate. I know we've talked in our previous uh, video about this not being cyberpunk, being more about like neon noir. But a lot of people just think you know near future 
cyberpunk, these things pop into their head and they think gear porn, right? Um, and the, you have a bit of a you have a bit of a precedent with Coriolis in having a game that had a an obscene amount of gear. Um, yeah. <laughs> just kind of curious about uh, how much. And we have actually seen a lot of uh, some screenshots and some stretch goals to do with like you know um, specific iconic uh, equipment from the films. How big of a role is gear going to play in this game? And are is there going to be a lot of it, or is it going to be something a bit more like Vazen, for example, which uh, it's a bit of a lighter touch? Mm. Right. Uh, two things, really. I mean, in. in... It's not a gear, it's not a game where you'll be collecting loads of gear. There won't be long gear lists on your character sheet. Basically, even if you 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 uh, requisition some piece of gear from from the tech unit, I don't know whatever you might need for you know you'll have have to hand it back when you're done. I mean, you you won't hoard crazy yeah. amounts of gear. you can buy personal. Uh, items in the game but, but that's not really what the game is about you won't be hoarding crazy amounts of gear so it's not a gear focused game in that sense at okay. all so in that yeah. sense it's more like it's 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 something that you'll be using uh, as part of the casework but it's not about collecting it uh, you know gathering gear uh, uh but that said gear can be really important and i think the way it's structured uh, in in the book, we are focusing more on 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 perhaps a bit more focus on f not on fewer items. So there, it's not a vast gear chapter with you know hundreds of pieces of gear. I mean, it's not well. Maybe there are when you count them together, <laughs> but it's, it's not really. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's it, not Coriolis it's, levels of of not gear. Coriolis, no, it's not. It's not that vast gear chapter in that sense it's yeah. more of a deep look into some more specific important pieces of gear that you will be using a lot as part of being yeah. you know a blade okay. um, and you know the huge gear lists thing so uh, that's okay. an answer i guess you know yeah. as far as it definitely if you enjoy gear stuff there's definitely going to be some really cool things in there cool yeah. All right, um, got two more questions left. I, there are more questions that I, I'm, we're running out of time that I'm not going to be able to cover off, but they're the two that I'm most interested in here. Um, somebody sure. asked about the city itself and how it's going to be laid out. And my my mind went to Coriolis again, where in Coriolis we have, for example, chapters on this the station itself, Coriolis, which is we have the station completely laid out with neighborhoods and locations within it, etc., and then we also have random tables in the Atlas Compendium where we can randomly generate a load of different stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, people have been talking about like other books. There's like a New World of Darkness book that allows you to create a city, uh, you know, randomly, etc. I'm kind of curious about this. It, LA is very much the the focus of this game. You've already said that. How much of that is going to be already laid out in the book, and how much of uh, will there be any, uh, you know, random neighborhood generators those sorts you know the random tables that you're kind of well known for for a lot of your games being very sandboxy how are you mm. how are you kind of approaching that here yeah i mean of course there's a solid section on on the city uh, in the core book definitely and i think you've already seen uh, you know uh, the map on the on the yeah. start of it. Mm -hmm. so my idea on, on what that will look like uh of course there's a, a few different sectors it's not where the city is described because it's it's huge. So we're focusing on the downtown area and Chinatown and those areas that that are mostly in focus. Um, and there uh, and so you have that kind of overview for sure. With uh, and and since it's a, a large location, but not it's not a galaxy. There is still you know a yeah. room to actually be fair specific and mention specific locations specific bars are mentioned and so on so there you can you can get a lot from that chapter alone but that's more of like a overview guess it here type of thing that you can use uh, but then uh, in terms of procedurally uh, generating things and, and lists and table or randomly generating things in in this game that is done primarily in 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 the concept in the context of the case file generator there's such a okay. thing i think it was not and in that one that we're working on, uh, it's it's a, 
you'll find you know a wide you know lots of random tables to help you generate locations and and twists and plots and npcs and everything and but it is in the context of creating a case file of course if you want to use it just to generate you know your random you know piece of land or, or some location for some other purpose you can do it but it, it's it's part of the case uh, file generator so that's okay. that's how it but found tables like that in the book yeah cool yeah very interesting okay last question then um again i asked it in the last video the last interview that we had but uh you didn't you didn't you weren't sure about whether it would be happening or not so i'd like an update on this please and that's uh, whether there will be any workshop support for this title all right yeah uh yeah not much of an update okay uh, <laughs> i know there's like i there's uh license uh discussions that go into this etc i'm just wondering if that yeah finished. yeah that's true i mean uh so it's it's uh, i mean as you know alien is not there yeah i'm not saying it could happen that we don't have anyone telling us it can never happen it just it's just it's just a bit more complicated than yeah. for our own uh fully own games so so yeah i'm have an update as of now i cannot say it will happen i'm not saying it will never happen but I, yeah. you know i don't think you should expect it to happen real soon uh, i mean if it does it, it'll you know we'll see okay uh, i think it would be, you know great if it could be done but i also realize there are some for these big brands it's a bit more complicated yes yeah. you know everything needs obviously for all licenses everything needs to be checked and approved by a license owner that that's just the way licensing works and the community content program like that it gets tricky so yeah. we'll see okay cool um i know you're you need to shoot off so uh thanks very much for for making the time and uh very excited to see the uh the pdf when it comes out yeah. And just to remind people, you've said that it's going to be available shortly after, I guess, like an alpha or a beta or something will be available shortly after the Kickstarter ends, right? That's the plan, yeah. So if you want to see if Blade Runner, if you're excited about it, you've got to be in it to see it, um, or you'll have to wait for retail release. Do we have... Uh, I, I, don't worry, this is all in the Kickstarter. We're not going to retread, retread that ground. So um, I'll let you go. Thanks very much, Tomas. And, uh, all right, thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well... There's a lot to process there, and yeah, I'm just even more excited to get my hands on the beta now. Um, as I said at the end of the interview there, you have to be in it to see it. That just means, again, I'm going to say it, if you want to see more information, if you want to see how they've put this thing together, you've got to be a Kickstarter backer. And if you're skeptical but still interested, I would highly recommend at least backing at the PDF level. You can always upgrade your your pledge to a higher tier, like a physical tier in the backer kit. Um, not backer kit. It's called Pledge Manager, actually, that they use in the Pledge Manager after the campaign ends if you like what you see and you decide you want to get a physical copy of it. I also wanted to give a, a quick shout out to everyone who asked a question in the various communities when I when I did ask if anyone had any pressing questions you know, pressing questions for Tomas. I apologize that I couldn't get through them all, but that's just the nature of the beast when you have a very limited amount of time with uh, someone in an interview. Anyway, that's me. Thanks so much for watching. Catch you next time.